Hello everybody, this is Brother Luke, Sin City Preacher. Today I want to continue the study of the book of Galatians, a verse-by-verse -verse commentary. The video I made yesterday, I guess I should apologize to everybody. It seems to me, when I watched it back, and even uh, as I was uh, recording the video, uh, I think I was a little incoherent. So uh, I apologize. I think I was kind of worn out. Uh, my wife has two sisters from Connecticut visiting, and uh, we went to the the Aviation Nation. It's a it's an annual air show at Nellis Air Force Base where you get to see old and new planes uh, uh, putting on this uh, demonstration. It's really a wonderful uh, thing to go to, but um, it, I think it just wore me out and I shouldn't have attempted the video. So I, I think the video is probably about uh, 90, 95% uh, okay, but there are some points where it just seemed like my, my thinking is, was just like all confused. So I'm sorry, I hope I will do better today. Um, I'm going to pick up now uh, where I left off last time. We finished chapter 4, so today we'll begin with chapter 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Well, um, that probably would make a lot of sense if we just uh, just pulled that verse uh, right out of the Bible and, and just looked at it individually without any context at all. Uh, I think that we would, could gain a lot by just this verse. But of course, context is one of the most important uh, um, ingredients uh, in, in uh, studying and, and uh, understanding the Bible. So, uh, obviously, the, uh, in the last chapter, we did discuss quite a bit this uh, uh, freedom versus bondage, the, uh, the, the, the free woman and the bond woman, uh, Hagar and uh, Sarah. So, um, uh, the, the point and, and the, the conclusion about all that is, hey, you should understand now that you are free you need to stand fast in that liberty, that freedom, uh, wherewith Christ hath made us free. We're, we're free in what way? Um, are we free to uh, uh, go and sin as much as we want? Yes. Uh, are we free to commit any particular type of sin? There's no limitation on on. No on uh, uh, the, the, let's say, the, the uh, category of sin. Uh, I've had people, particularly some of the street preachers I used to work with, um, they would say to me, Brother Luke, you, you don't really believe that a, a practicing homosexual could be saved to you. And uh, I said, well, um, what about you? You're a practicing sinner. So, well, what do you mean? Well, you're practicing self-righteous righteousness and spiritual pride right now before my eyes. So, can you be saved? Uh, but some people want to uh, elevate uh, whatever category of sin that, that they feel is is the worst, the most reprehensible. Uh, so. The, the point is, we are free to sin as much as we want. We are free to submit uh, to commit any type of sin we want. Uh, it will not affect our salvation at all. Uh, but um, most people, when they put their faith in Jesus, uh, they did it be because uh, they they understood um, the, the, the gospel. They understood the identity of Jesus. They understood what he's done for us. They understood that salvation is a free gift. Uh, and uh, 
uh, apart from any religious works on our part. So if they understood it, then they believed and they accepted the free gift uh, with a particular mindset. And with that mindset, I think, would, um, for the most part, probably a very high percentage of people also um, it would be accompanied with an attitude that no i don't i don't want to use this salvation this liberty as a license to go and sin no we don't want to do that uh, if a person does have that attitude well yeah they have the freedom to do it but i mean without well, with only a very few exceptions, we don't want to do that. We don't want to use it as a license to sin. Um, the Holy Spirit also is, uh, once it the Holy Spirit enters us, it begins working on us. It begins working on us at that very moment, uh, transforming us. Uh, our mind, our thinking, our attitudes, our desires, our, our impulses, uh, everything, the Holy Spirit is trying to perfect us in that, those ways. And uh, uh, every believer then has, um, they, we engage the Holy Spirit. We, we either understand the Holy Spirit is uh, uh, sensitizing my conscience, uh, making me more aware that Wait a second. Uh, I remember years ago, uh, I was going to cancel a doctor's appointment. No, or, or maybe I was going to be late or something. But I was thinking in my mind of a little white lie to tell them to uh, to justify this uh, cancellation or being late, uh, and and. But I believe the Holy Spirit uh, just like shook me. So wait, wait a second. What's wrong with you, Luke? Your 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 nature it, it, it is to just make up a lie. It, it just it it just comes so naturally for you to think. Well, the answer to this little problem is just a little white lie. Now that's that's my natural response. Uh, but. Uh, uh, the Holy Spirit made me aware of that. I thought, wait a second. Not only do I not want to have that in my reflex, my reflex is to lie, but also I don't want to, uh, uh, I, I, I don't want to use it for that, that purpose when it's actually stupid. It's pointless. Well, why, why do it? There are, there are some lies in life that are justified that are righteous lies. Uh, for example, if the, the Nazis were looking for Jews and you actually were hiding a Jew, uh, you, you would be justified in lying to the Nazis about it in order to save the Jews' life. So not all lies are evil, um, but the kind of lie that I was going to do was like a, a silly, pointless lie. Not only was it just the wrong thing to do, but it was absolutely unnecessary. I could have said nothing, and and uh, I wouldn't have had any consequences. Just just tell them the truth that well, um, I just don't feel like going today. I'd rather change it to a different day, or or there's something else I want to do instead. Change my mind. I, whatever it is, the truth wouldn't have hurt me. But my instinct, my reflex, my natural response was to lie. Um, but the, the, I, I'm not sure why I went into such a uh, detailed uh, explanation of that, but uh, the point is, when we put our faith in Jesus, from that moment until our last breath, the Holy Spirit is attempting to transform us. Uh, we can embrace the promptings of the Spirit and work with it and, and let the Holy Spirit start changing our desires and our reflex responses to life um, uh, or we can resist it and uh, probably we all resist the spirit sometimes where the spirit is speaking to our conscience and we kind of like shut it up and we try to tune it out 
But if you resist the Holy Spirit uh, too much, then what happens is uh, the, the Spirit is not only grieved, but the Spirit could become quenched. And I guess we could liken it to building up calluses. Uh, you just kind of build a callus over your conscience. Uh, and uh, the Holy Spirit is still speaking to you, trying to direct you, uh, but you're not even aware of it. You've just tuned it out for so long. But if we cooperate with the Holy Spirit, then we, we, uh, our, our attitudes in life change, and we, we don't have the attitude that, yes, I'm going to use this liberty now as a license to sin. Wow, I really, I got it made now, because I know I'm going to go to heaven no matter what, so I, I'll just, uh, you know, not only will I sin as much as I want, but wow, I can even do any sin. Well, what kind of sin would be a lot of fun to do right now? I mean, I can do it. I'm free to do it. Well, yeah, there may be some examples of people who have done that. Uh, I think it's few and far between, and, and uh, that's, that's not uh, a good argument against this liberty and this easy believism uh, that we have a license to sin. Um, what we do have is a license to rest. Brother Ronnie, who is, uh, many of you know, is hood minister or sainthood, uh, he, uh, uh, he coined the phrase license to rest. I'd like to make sure he gets credit for that. I think I think he is an inspired uh, saint. Uh, when he writes a comment, if you ever see a comment written by him, Hood Minister St. Hood or Brother Ronnie, uh, I don't know what his channel is going by now, but uh, his, his comments are, I believe, so beautifully written and, and the, the, the sentiments are, are so wonderful that it's it's almost as like reading the Psalms. It's almost like the the the, the poetry and songs of David. So thank you, Brother Ronnie, uh, for everything. But thank you for that term, license to rest. So again, just the first verse we've covered so far. But it says, "Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty, in the freedom that is, wherewith Christ hath made us free. Christ made us free." Uh, and uh, we're free to what? We're free to rest. Just imagine that, let's say that you're just completely worn out because of the trials and tribulations of life, because of sickness, because of hardship, because just you're just exhausted. And imagine that Jesus says, come to me, all you who are heavy laden, um, uh, I will give you rest and you are resting in the arms of Jesus and he's just he's got you in his arms and he's comforting you and that's that's we have a right to do that we have a right to rest in Jesus we don't have to feel that we're burdened to perform that we've got to really work really hard to keep our salvation because uh if we get off that treadmill for a moment, the salvation will be lost. Uh, no, when we put our faith in Jesus, we receive salvation as a free gift. Uh, from that moment forward, nothing can undo it. We, uh, uh, no religious works are required on our part to maintain the salvation. And I certainly don't have to do any works to prove to you that I'm truly saved. Uh, and if you are trying to judge people's salvation, as some people use the book of James, that, well, in man's sight, we, we, uh, we judge their salvation by their works. God can see into their heart. But since we can't see into their heart, we have to judge them by their works. Well, that is BS. It makes me angry and sick when people misuse that book in that way. I will judge a person's salvation or uh, justify them the same way God does, by what they believe, by their faith. I'm not going to look at a person's life, whether they're 
They're doing all kinds of good works. They're working real hard like a Jehovah's Witness. They're working real hard like a, a really moral, upright Mormon. Uh, so therefore, they, maybe they're saved because look how good their lives appear to be. Uh, or let's say that they are living in the street, they're on drugs, and they are, you know, they're even uh, stealing to get food, and they, they, their lives are just really a mess. And, uh, but they tell me, uh, Jesus promised I'm going to heaven if I would put my faith in him, and I believe him. He paid for my sins. I believe I'm going to go to heaven for that reason alone. Well, that confession of faith to me is, is what uh, will justify him. We're justified by faith, not by our works. So, um, uh, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free, uh, free to rest, that is, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Bondage is religion. Believing that there are some religious requirements that you must do to get saved, to stay saved, or to prove to everybody else, oh, yeah, you're truly saved. That is BS. Let's look at verse 1 in the Amplified. It was for this freedom that Christ set us free, completely liberating us. Therefore, keep standing firm and do not be subject again to the yoke of slavery, which you once removed. Okay, uh, verse two in the KJV. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. Uh, I've mentioned this uh, several times in videos. And I, I guess I'll just continue mentioning it probably for the rest of my life that uh, I was working on a verse by verse commentary of the book of Acts with two brothers. You, I hope you will watch that. That that playlist is very, very important. It is like a, uh, you know, a, a bookend to Gal Galatians. Go, uh, you got uh, Galatians and Hebrews on each side of the book of Acts. And, you know, you should, uh, and then you've got James in the middle of it, confounding the whole thing because it's arguing against uh, against uh, you know um, Galatians and Hebrews. Uh, but um, in when I was doing this teaching on the Book of Acts, we get to chapter fifteen, verse one, and these Judaizers up here in the area where Paul is, Paul and his, his disciples. And the Judaizers say, you cannot be saved unless you are circumcised. Of course, there was much more to it. They, they believed that circumcision was, was on the list, but there's, a, there's quite a list of things you've got to do, uh, including circumcision. Uh, faith alone in Christ alone, that's not enough. Because as a Judaizer, I'm telling you, you've got to practice Judaism. And the first thing you do in Judaism is you get circumcised. So uh, that's what this verse really boils down to, is this uh, claim by the Judaizers that you've got to be circumcised and you've got to follow the dietary laws uh, and you, you've got to uh, keep the Sabbath. Uh, and don't forget to go to the temple, do your worshiping in the temple, and you better keep on doing those animal sacrifices. So these are the things that um, they were teaching people that you had to do, and that Paul was a false apostle telling you that none of that's necessary. Well, Paul uh, not only says that none of it's necessary, but he says if you do it, and I believe... Uh, it's not just the fact that you're doing it, but the fact that you put your faith in it. You believe that by doing it, you are assisting the salvation somehow. You're fulfilling another requirement for your salvation. So Paul says, not only uh, should you not do it, but if you do it, you're not saved. Behold, I, I Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ 
shall profit you nothing. So how does Christ profit us? Well, the first thing Christ does to profit us is our sins are paid for and, and we receive the gift of eternal life. Uh, and then, of course, after that point, Christ profits us by uh, the, the loving relationship, the fellowship we have with him and by the Holy Spirit transforming us and by communing or communicating with, with uh, Christ, then uh, we, uh, we can come to him with all of our needs, uh, prayers of supplication. Uh, let's look at verse 2 in the uh, Amplified. Notice it is I, Paul, who tells you that if you receive circumcision as a supposed requirement of salvation, Christ will be of no benefit to you, for if for you will lack the faith in Christ that is necessary for salvation. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Uh, the Amplified, uh, I, I love the translation, even though uh, every once in a while I find something that has a either a hint or a, an outright uh, teaching of a lordship salvation. So we've got to always take the translations and compare them with the KJV, uh, test them against the KJV. Uh, but uh, for the most part, the Amplified, I find it's, it, it can be very, very helpful. And in this case, what does it do? It says, if you receive circumcision, now this is their insertion, as a supposed requirement for salvation. And that's the point I was making when I was expounding on, uh, on uh, uh, verse uh, 2 in the uh, KJV. When I said that it's not, uh, it's not that someone got circumcised. It's that they believe that you know, they must get circumcised to fill a, requir a requirement for their salvation. That's when it's a problem. If a person does something because they either have some desire to do it, they think, oh, I want to be circumcised because everybody in my family is circumcised. Uh, or uh, I, I want to be circumcised because I think there's, there's some uh, health or hygiene uh, benefits from it. If, then fine, you can be circumcised. It doesn't mean every person gets circumcised is cursed and damned. No, if, but if you believe that you're getting circumcised in order to go to heaven, then Christ has no effect to you. That means no benefit to you. That means you, know, you don't you don't have eternal life. You're not going to heaven. It's that it's that blunt. It's that clear. And to the brothers that uh, are arguing against me with that, what in the world is wrong with you? They one of them even said in in our conversation about it was that he's not one of those one hundred percenters. If you're not a one hundred percenter, you're not saved. Because believing faith alone, that means that it's only faith. There's there's no circumcision, there's no water baptism, there's no Judaism, there's no uh, anything. It's only faith. Faith alone in Christ alone. And the faith must be in the person of Jesus Christ. We believe he is the one that has the power to give us the forgiveness of sins, eternal life. We, we believe that uh, he promises us that if we put our faith in him. And we, we believe he will not break the promise. So we feel we are guaranteed we're going to go to heaven. So, uh, um, yeah, you, you, you cannot divide your faith between Jesus and something else. You, your faith must be 100% in Jesus. I think I have a video titled, um, 100% unadulterated grace. So it's something unadulterated. Adulterated means that it's not pure. Uh, and, and uh, you know, when we look at the commandments and, and see thou shalt not commit adultery, um, most people assume that that's talking about uh, 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 sexual, a sexual sin. Uh, but adultery also is the mixing of the races. With the, the Jews were 
told to not associate with the, the rest of the world and mix. Don't intermarry because uh, if you do, the pagan religions will be brought into these fa the families and never be, be confused. Uh, the, the mother is, 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 believes in paganism and the father is Jewish and now there's confusion in the family and then maybe the Judaism gets all watered down and uh, and uh, uh, so uh, God is, is, says it, nation of Israel, the Jewish people, we need you to be isolated, separated from the rest of the world so that you, your, uh, your faith in your religion is pure, uh, unadulterated. Unadulterated means it's no longer pure. It could be 99% Judaism, but then 1% of paganism ruins it. It's the same thing with uh, our faith. Uh, if you got 99% faith in Jesus, but then you, you say, well, there is one other thing you got to do. You got to be circumcised or you got to be water baptized. Everybody knows that. Well, no, then it's adulterated. Uh, you committed adultery with the gospel. Uh, look at verse 3 in the KJV. Uh, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to do the whole law. So once you put your faith in circumcision, then uh, basically you've signed a contract saying that uh, I also am going to follow all the laws of Judaism uh, completely and perfectly for the rest of my life. And uh, Peter said to James uh, that when he wanted to impose Judaism on the Gentiles, he says, why are you doing that? Trying to impose them on something that, that we, we've never been able to do. Us and our fathers, we've never been able to follow Judaism perfectly. And now you're trying to impose it on the Gentiles. Uh, so um, when you, uh, as Paul says here, uh, every man that is circumcised, he is a debtor to do the whole law. So as soon as you believe that there is any legal requirement for your salvation, then then what you've done is you've opened up Pandora's box of, okay, there, not only that, but there's 612 more laws. Uh, and whether it, we're, we're zeroing in on the legalism of Judaism or the legalism of some other religion uh, or just even the legalism of a conscience saying that uh, uh, the, the Bible says that uh, uh, God has written the law on our heart as Gentiles, giving us a conscience to understand what's right and wrong. So even then, uh, if a person is, <clears throat> no Gentile has ever been under the Mosaic laws unless he embraces Judaism. But uh, the, the laws of Moses, uh, uh, there are 613 laws written down. Uh, Ten of them were written on stone by the finger of God. And uh, all 613 of them, though, uh, they were given to the Jewish people, the nation of Israel. They were not given to uh, the United States of America. They were not, not given to uh, Africa or Australia or any place else in the world. Uh, all the non-Jews, which probably represents 95 or 97 or 99% of the world's population, are non-Jews. These Gentiles were never put under Jew, uh, the, the Mosaic laws. And that is one of the biggest misunderstandings, thinking that as Christians, we're supposed to follow the Ten Commandments or, or you know, anything else in Judaism. Uh, but we were given the law of conscience, as Paul, Paul says, that we, 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 our conscience tells us right and wrong. Uh, so even if you're just following the law of conscience, you can't do it perfectly. You, you better do it perfectly if you decide you're going to go to heaven through personal merit, then you better be perfect. And you can't be perfect. So that should tell you that, wait, you need to be saved. You need the Savior. There's one Savior, Jesus Christ. Um, look at verse 3 in the, in the Amplified. 
Once more, I solemnly affirm to every man who receives circumcision uh, as a supposed requirement of salvation that he is under obligation and required to keep the whole law. Okay, verse 4 in the uh, KJV. Christ is become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, ye are fallen from grace. Uh, so if you're somebody who believes you, you, you can go to heaven by following laws, by being religious, by um, performing. Your life is a performance before God, and, and if your performance is good enough, uh, if there's more good in your life than bad, God will say, oh, okay, on the balance scale of right and wrong, uh, you did pretty good, so you get to go to heaven. No, God's standard is perfection, so you can't just be relatively good, better than your neighbor. You have to be 100% perfect like Jesus. Uh, so, uh, but if, if you do believe, if you decide that you're, you're not going to go the Christian way, which is relying on Christ, trusting Christ. Instead, you're going to go the religion way, whether it's Christianity or any religion. Here's a set of rules and do's and don'ts, and you've got to do this, and if you do well enough, perhaps God will reward you with heaven. Uh, if that's what you decide to do, then it says that uh, Christ is no effect unto you. So, that means that um, the benefit of him dying for your sins, that it won't help you. Uh, the, the free gift that he offers you for eternal life and heaven, uh, that that's uh, not going to benefit you. You get none of that. Uh, he says, you, you are fallen from grace. That means that you are, uh, you're not, uh, you don't have the grace of God. You don't have the grace of God unless you believe in Jesus. That God is being gracious by offering you eternal life as a free gift. But unless you believe in Jesus and accept that, you don't have the grace. You're not taking advantage of it. Let me see what verse 4 is in the Amplified. You have been severed from Christ if you seek to be justified that is declared free of the guilt of sin and its penalty, and placed in right standing with God through the law. Ye, you have fallen from grace, for you have lost your grasp on God's unmerited favor and blessing. We just have to be careful to not uh, interpret fallen from grace as meaning you've fallen from your salvation. You were saved, and now, you know, Jesus... Yeah, um, the icon on my channel is Jesus' uh, nail-pierced hand reaching out like this. And another, uh, a person, their hand reaching towards Jesus. It's a beautiful illustration that Jesus is offering his hand of salvation to everyone. And uh, everybody has the, the freedom to embrace Jesus and, and receive his hand and be pulled from condemnation and, and pulled into life everlasting. And uh, but. Uh, once Jesus and you and Jesus grasp hands, the Bible says that Jesus has us in the palm of his hand and no one can pluck us out. It says he will never leave us or forsake us. And, and so uh, here is a picture of Jesus holding on to me. I'm holding on to Jesus. And this is when, when I got saved. Let's say at some point in my life, my I started sinning and doing a lot of things. And, I, and, and so you think that I'm not, maybe I'm not saved because I'm sinning, but Jesus will let go of me, even though I've gone off and become a prodigal. I've backslidden, but Jesus will not let go of me. Let's say at some point in my life, my faith wanes. Uh, because of some challenges in life, I start questioning God and my, my faith is less. Or my faith is gone. Let's say that I no longer even believe. Let's say that I become an atheist. Let's say I become an anti-theist, someone who 
hates the whole idea of God and curses the God and curses everybody who who believes in God, especially the God of the Bible, especially those Bible thumpers and Christians. You know, uh, we we hate them. Well, if that's the case, I've let go, but Jesus will not let go of me, no matter what. I'm going to heaven whether I like it or not, because Jesus, the Bible says, even if we have no faith, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. He will be faithful to his promise. He promised me, Luke, you're going to go to heaven because you put your faith in me. I put the Holy Spirit in you as an earnest deposit. And uh, uh, when you die, I'm going to take you to heaven. Or if there, you're alive at the resurrection and you'll be uh, you'll be uh, re uh, re raptured or um, quickened and uh, receive your glorified body without having to die. But when that happens, uh, you're, you're going to go to heaven because I promised it to you. And since I promised it to you, uh, I, I have to be faithful to my promise because as God, I cannot lie. As God, I cannot break a promise. So uh, he remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. God cannot deny himself, his character, his his identity, his nature would be ruined and, and, and uh, God would not be God if he could just start lying to us and breaking his promises. So you can rest assured, you can rest easy. Uh, you have this blessed assurance, assurance or guarantee, you're guaranteed you're going to go to heaven. Um, Let me see. I guess I can go a few minutes more. Um, verse 5 in the KJV. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. For we, through the Spirit, wait for the hope of righteousness by faith. All right. Well, maybe the Amplified will help me with that one. Uh, for we not relying on the law, but through the strength and power of the Holy Spirit, by faith, are waiting confidently for the hope of righteousness, that is, the completion of our salvation. Uh, well, the hope of righteousness, well, that gets us to um, uh, these words. Brother Rob B, uh, he, he likes to ask a lot of questions and, and uh, wants, wants us to, uh, uh, you know, make sure we differentiate between with certain words that are uh, commonly thrown around and are we really using them properly? Uh, justification, sanctification, uh, redemption, regeneration, all these, these kinds of words, but, uh, the word I'm thinking of is sanctification. Now, sanctification means that you are declared holy, righteous, without sin. And it also means that you are set apart. So let's picture it this way. When I put my faith in Jesus, instantly and simultaneously, these things happen. The Holy Spirit of God entered me. I was indwelled with the Spirit. You know, I was baptized with the Spirit. That's when the Spirit first entered. Uh, uh, the Holy Spirit indwelled me means it, it will live in me and will live in me forever. That means I'm sealed with the Holy Spirit. It means that my spirit, which was a dead stub, was the Holy Spirit united and quickened and brought my spirit to life. So I have a, uh, a living spirit. My spirit and the Holy Spirit are united. So uh, I would, I'm born again spiritually. Um, and now what has not happened is my body has not been glorified. I still have this body that has a sin nature. So sin will come naturally to me. Uh, as we grow and mature, uh, then our, our desires 
gradually are changing so that we don't instinctively sin. We, we will start instinctively to do the right things, do good things. Um, but it's a, it's a, it's a process that, that takes place over our lifetime. And, and how, how high someone achieves, uh, their, uh, their spiritual maturity is varies. Some individuals, uh, become very mature. And some people, you just don't see any maturity at all. Or, or you see much less. Uh, and some people mature at a quick rate, like uh, immediately or uh, very soon, all of a sudden you see these dramatic changes. And, and uh, uh, other people, this um, spiritual maturity uh, happens uh, over a long pro process of many, many years, many, many decades, a lifetime, where it's gradual and slow. But so we're unique individuals. We should not try to impose a per particular type of chart uh, on everybody saying that if you don't meet my vision of what, uh, you know, how a Christian is supposed to grow and mature, then I'm going to challenge your salvation. Uh, so some things happen at the moment of salvation, and then some things happen over the rest of our life, and, and that is spiritual growth and maturity. <clears throat> and uh, I used to believe that sanctification was something that would happen gradually over a lifetime. We get more and more holy, but the Bible says that we're declared holy, uh, we're sanctified immediately. So sanctification happens at the instant of, uh, of faith. Um, and so you can imagine that, let's say that there's a, uh, a crowd of people and God is looking over them and he's going to have to choose and, uh, you know, God chooses who gets saved, right? Well, God's looking at the crowd of people throughout history, and he says, uh, I choose you, and I choose you, and I choose you. See, uh, Calvinist says that God is choosing them randomly, that uh, not based on any merit on our part, but, uh, but the scripture says God chooses us based upon who's wearing that robe, uh, the, the, uh, the robe of righteousness, the, uh, uh, the wedding garment in the parable uh, when it talks about the wedding garment these people if they have the wedding garment they enter if they don't have a garment the door is closed they don't get to come in and so uh, that's how God's choosing it so he's looking at the masses of people and choosing all those who have the wedding garment how do you get the wedding garment well as soon as you put your faith completely in Jesus you're covered with his righteousness uh, so then what happens is God picks you up and puts you in this little group over here. You're set apart from the masses of humanity. You are set apart because God says, these are the holy ones. Another holy one, another holy one. Let me find these. Everybody that has that robe on, that, that uh, wedding garment. Okay, here's another one. Uh, they are righteous. They got my son's righteousness. So. I'm going to pick them up and I'm going to set them apart and put them over here. So these people are all set apart and knowing that they are, they are, uh, they have a reservation for heaven and eternal life. Uh, they have the earnest deposit. The Holy Spirit is living in them, but I'm setting them apart for them to get the rest of the promise, which is the glorified body and you know, eternal life in heaven. Uh, Let's look at verse 5 in the Amplified. For we, not relying on the law, but through the strength and power of the Holy Spirit, by faith, are waiting confidently for the hope of righteousness, the completion of our salvation. Uh, now, I know some wonderful saints that they still teach that uh, some of them teach that sanctification is a lifelong process. I, I, I prefer to use the, the term uh, spiritual growth and maturity is a lifelong process. Uh, but sanctification, I believe, is an instantaneous thing that happens just like just like uh, the baptism of the Spirit, the sealing of the Spirit, the quickening, the being born again as a child of God, uh, the sanctification, the justification. All these things happen at the moment of faith. Uh, but so some people believe that the sanctification is a lifelong process, 
And then some people believe that sanctification is twofold, where you have, um, yeah, you're set apart uh, immediately, declared holy and righteous, but then oh, over your lifetime, as you grow and mature, you're being sanctified. I just I think that's, uh, it's not a serious mistake. I just disagree with using sanctification in that way. Uh, all right, so that's verse five. How many verses are there in this? Verse 26. Usually I try to get halfway through the chapter, but I don't want to overdo it today and make it, this video too long. I spent so much time on verse one. that. Uh, so for now, let me uh, close the, the study for today. And uh, I, I just want to keep reminding everybody that if you just, uh, just kind of accidentally came across this video and you, you've watched it and you're interested, I want you to know that this is part of a series. And I, I believe that it will greatly benefit you if you will watch this series from the beginning. The title of the playlist is uh, The Book of Galatians, a verse-by-verse -verse commentary. So just find that playlist and then don't skip over the introduction. Usually in my introduction videos are only about five minutes to basically tell you what the playlist is about. The introduction video on this playlist is uh, almost an hour and it's, but it's, I had to spend an hour because the foundation that needs to be laid so that you can understand what, 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 is, what about the book of James? How does that fit into all this? Uh, it, it seemed like James is contradicting Paul. Oh, no, no, people will argue, no, he's no contradiction. You just have to understand it correctly. So people are bending over backwards trying to explain to you all the different ways that they can say that, no, no, they're, Paul and James are in agreement. Well, I believe that Paul and James were not in agreement. And I believe that if you watch my playlist, the book of Acts, the book of Galatians, uh, and uh, uh, you'll, um, and, and I also have a playlist titled uh, um, Early Church History. Uh, and also one called uh, James and Paul, the shocking facts. So all of these together are, they're all really to help us understand why is it that the book of James, where we get saved, we read the gospel of John, and then we read Paul's letters and we're so excited saying, not only did I get saved by believing, but there's no work that I have to do to keep my salvation and I can never lose it. And, and uh, and then, oh, and I get to the book of James, and oh, God, what happened? This is, doesn't make sense. Everything I've read is telling me that it's a free gift. And then James is saying that you're justified by your works and not by faith only. Paul is saying you're justified by faith alone, not by works. Uh, and so when and this is almost a universal reaction, I would think. Think back. The first time you're reading the Bible through and you, you get to the book of James, it's shocking to see that James is contradicting Paul. And then, of course, we start learning that, wait a second, there's a lot of theologians that are, are teaching us that, no, they don't contradict each other. Uh, they don't disagree. You just need to understand it correctly. Uh, and uh, so they, they have all of these different methodologies for justifying or, or, or reconciling James. But I believe that uh, the way to understand James is in the context of church history. We have to understand that church history was about the first 30 years of church history. We had a church that's really nothing like what we have today. They, first of all, they thought they were Gentiles couldn't be part of it. And secondly, they thought that you had to be a Jew and then you can believe in Jesus. You practice Judaism and you believe in Jesus. But they thought that basically it's like, you know, some people, they say, well, you've got to repent of your sins and believe in Jesus. Well, so there's two parts. As Ray Comfort says, uh, salvation is a coin with two sides. Believe in Jesus, repent of your sins. 
And but in the beginning of the church, it was kind of like that. They believed that well, there's two parts to this. You got to practice Judaism and believe in Jesus. So uh, these are the errors of the beginning of the church, and it was we can see about a 30-year history where this argument persisted. So if you will take the time to watch this whole playlist and all uh, the others, you will be one of those very rare uh, few people that really understands uh, how this all fits together properly. Thank you for watching. Bless you all in the name of our great Savior God, Jesus.